chapter number 1 with me tonight. Colossians has four chapters, folks. It's a short book, four chapters. And uh, the first two chapters are what we're going to deal with tonight because it bears directly on just exactly who the Lord Jesus Christ is. Colossians chapter number 1, verse 15. The Bible said he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body of the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. Father, bless your holy word. Tonight, in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Every book in the Bible has its purpose. It has its reason for being there. It has its message. The Gospels are there to give us the life of Christ. And then the Gospel of John is set in there to show us that Christ is from eternity past into eternity future. The Gospel of John is written that you might believe because it bears directly on the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. The book of Acts is the early history of the New Testament church. The book of Romans is a book that sets forth the justification by faith and that salvation is for all men. And the book of Romans is a powerful book in that sense because it lays the foundation for all of the other Pauline epistles. Every epistle the Apostle Paul wrote has a distinct message. For example, the book of Ephesians is reaching up into the heavens and talking about the mind of God that goes back into eternity past and into eternity future and that he works all things according to the counsel of his own will. The book of Galatians deals with the perversion and corruption of the word of God and how that he transmitted it through the apostle Paul and made certain that you would get God's word today exactly the way the Lord wanted you to have it, even if Paul had to confront Peter to get it it done. And the book of Colossians, the first two chapters of Colossians, sets forth who Christ is. It talks about his essence. And this, my friend, exalts him. And this is what we want to talk about tonight. If you'll notice over here in Colossians chapter number 1 and verse number 18, verse 17 rather, he is before all things and by him all things consist. If you will watch that video on the Lion of Judah about DNA, Along about uh, 31 minutes into it, you'll see a, a double spiral helix. You'll see them talk about, and they'll show you a graphic, of how that, that helix is coded with some of the most complicated, intricate, unbelievable code that you could ever imagine. There is no way that anything like that could possibly just happen. An intelligent mind was behind that. But something can happen occasionally to the DNA in your body. You can have problems that arise and it get out of whack. It can, be, it can get off a structure the way it should be. This thing is made in such a fashion that it goes up and down that DNA spiral and repairs itself. Now, there's no in the world, there's no way under the sun that something like that could possibly happen like the evolutionist teaches. But who do you think is doing that? He upholds all things by the word of his power, and by him it consists. It is the active agency of the Lord God himself that holds everything together that is held together. They talk about the, the power that is involved or that is latent in something like a tree or uh, any other intimate object, something as small as a flower or, uh, you know, a stick or something like that. And they say that there is an enormous, unbelievable amount of energy that is, cons that, is, that is in this and that all you have to do is to have the right code to release that energy and it is mind-boggling at the amount of energy that's in there. Where did that come from? That came from God. That came from the one who holds it all together by the word of his power. The scripture says that the time is going to come when the elements melt with fervent heat. The time is going to come when everything that you understand as a world and as creation will pass away. It will be gone. And the reason it's going to do that is because the time is going to come when the Lord God Almighty will cease to hold it together and it's gone. Just like that. 
And the unsaved man one day is going to stand before a great white throne judgment. And that great white throne judgment is going to have the judge sitting on it. And he's going to stand on nothing. He's going to be held up in space before God Almighty to be judged. It will finally begin to sink into his mind before he's cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. If he bothers to look beneath him and look above him and look around him, nothing exists outside that creator. And that creator is about to judge him for his sins. I don't know of anything that could be more horrible in my life that I can never imagine than to be standing somewhere stripped clean and come face to face with your maker and realize he's almighty God and you wouldn't even exist for a moment without him. So in the book of Colossians chapter number one, it talks about not only the fact that he holds it together, but by him all things were made. They were created, folks. Everything that exists was brought into existence by the creative power of Almighty God. And who did this? It's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no way that you can read Colossians chapter number 1 without coming away and absolutely convinced that the Lord Jesus Christ is the Creator. He's Almighty God in flesh. And everything that stays together stays together because of His power and His might. Amen. That's a wonderful thing because it tells you who he is. The Apostle Paul, in order to build the rest of what he's going to build in the first chapter and the second chapter of Colossians, he first must lay the foundation of who the Lord Jesus Christ is. And I'm it's sad tonight. It's sad tonight because so many people that go to church every Sunday don't have a clue who he is. They don't know he's the Lord. They don't know the Lord Jesus Christ is Almighty God. Folks, he's Almighty God. Amen. He was here on this earth. He was subject to the Father. He said, don't call me good. There's none good but the Father. And for 33, as I preached to you this morning, 33 and a half years, he lived a perfect, sinless life and established a righteousness by that life that would ascend into the very presence of Almighty God. That righteousness is what God applies to you in order to justify you, in order to give you the right to come into his presence. But now, at the right hand of the Father exalted, the Lord Jesus Christ is God Almighty in flesh manifested to his creation. Do you realize, folks, the Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter number 6 that he dwells in the light which no man can see, which no man hath seen, no man can approach him to. God the Father is an invisible spirit being that nothing has ever seen, never has seen. And unless God the Father chooses by virtue of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost to make himself known, they never will see him. But the Lord Jesus Christ is the one seated on that throne and all judgment has been given to him. And if you ever see God, you'll see the Lord Jesus. And if there's more to see, then God will manifest himself in a way where we can understand him. He has to bring me up to his level, come down to my level, and meet me somewhere between there and here for me to even begin to comprehend the one who made everything. Amen. So Colossians chapter number 1 talks about who he is. Colossians chapter number 2 and verse number 10 tells us what he did. In Colossians 2.10, the Bible said you're complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. What's a principality and power? Is it a wicked man? No. It's the power above that man. It's the power that energizes that man. Is the Antichrist alive right now? He may very well be. Are we, are we, are we at the door of the second coming? We may very well be. Are we close to the rapture of the church of God? We may be so close that it could be imminent. In other words, at any moment, it could take place. But the power that you see, the power of human beings, the power of wicked men is nothing. That's what, not what we're against. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places. Presidents come and presidents go. Nations rise and nations cease to exist. They're here today and they're gone tomorrow. But these principalities and powers are the ones pulling the strings, calling the shots, and moving on the hearts of men. When you talk about a worldwide conspiracy, a one world government, like Henry Kissinger who keeps talking about the, the, world, the one world government, when you, hear him, when you hear him keep talking about the new world order, 
He's talking about that because there is a spirit above him that is energizing him, that is moving him, that is inspiring him, that is giving him his purpose in life and his life. And the spirit that is doing that is the principality and power and spiritual wickedness in high places. And so we have a president today who may be gone in two years and never hear and see from see or hear from him again. He may go off into oblivion or he may rise higher in the hierarchy under the principality and power. So all I have to do tonight is simply wait and watch and pray, but it will come to pass exactly the way God said that it would. Notice what he said in Colossians 2 verse 10, though. This is important. You are complete in him, which is the head of all principality, in whom also you are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. So no man did this for you in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. What's he talking about? What do you mean circumcision of Christ buried with him in baptism, wherein also you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead and you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh hath he quickened together with him having forgiven you all trespasses the apostle paul tells you about a spiritual operation that took place at the moment you were born again your body and soul and spirit were separated before you were born again your body was stuck to your soul and your spirit was dead but a born-again spirit cannot have a connection to this unsaved body. They are enemies of each other. There is an animosity between the two. They are never in connection. They are mortal enemies. The spirit of God that dwells within me, that gives me life, has regenerated my dead spirit, and now my spirit has been born of the Holy Spirit, born of God. Since that happened, and it did happen when you were saved, then God did a great favor for me. He cut me free from this body. I am no longer my body. The New Testament makes a subtle difference time and time and time again between the body of the believer and the believer. The Old Testament is not like that. And the reason the Old Testament is not like that is because the believer in the Old Testament, though a true believer and though saved, is not born again. Therefore, the body and the soul are spoken of synonymously. A clear distinction is not made between the two. Think about it for a moment. If there is a difference, if the, if the Old Testament saint is like the New Testament saint, where the spirit is cut free from the body, then what is the point of Colossians 2? When he says that he did this when you were born again. That's the point. That's why. If this was a common knowledge, there's no sense here. This is why to Nicodemus. Nicodemus, you must be born again. You must be born from above. You must be born of God. Nicodemus, you need to be saved. Amen. But the Old Testament saint was saved, but he wasn't born again. The new birth was wrought at the cross at Calvary when the New Testament, the new blood covenant, was ratified. In plainer words, it was made legal and brought into effect. Not until the Lord Jesus Christ died at the cross was the blood covenant brought into effect. There was no blood shed. It was not until he shed his blood at the cross that the blood covenant was ratified, made legal, brought binding between God and man. In order for that blood covenant to have its effect upon you, this must take place. So when the blood covers your sins and washes your sins away, God Almighty performs an operation in you that is a one-time operation that never needs to be repeated. When he circumcises you, he cuts the flesh away from the spirit. And the soul becomes an intermediary. The soul can touch the flesh and the soul can touch the spirit. You become a tripart being. There is no clear distinction in the Old Testament made about soul and spirit. 
This is why you, they're spoken of synonymously. But the New Testament makes a very clear distinction between body, soul, and spirit. And the reason it does is because that spirit has now been born of God, will never be unborn of God. If you've been born again, you're born again forever. But the soul that sinneth, it can die. Because if the soul now that is saved is living for the flesh, then the flesh will draw that soul down and that soul will die. But 1 Corinthians chapter number 5 says plainly that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. The spirit will never be unsaved and can never lose that eternal uh, eternal uh, new birth that God gives the spirit. The spirit is not saved, folks. The spirit is born again. The soul is saved, and the body becomes a, a vessel, a tabernacle that you live in until you shed it, and that silver cord is broken, and that body is gone. And where's the body going? It's going to where it came from. He didn't save the body. It goes back to the dust from whence it came. And so when the Apostle Paul in Colossians chapter number 2, he's giving you the mechanics of the new birth. See? He's telling you, somebody said, well, I got saved. Somebody said, I was born again. Hallelujah. But how did it happen? What happened? What took place at the moment you were born again? Colossians 2 tells you. Colossians 2 tells you exactly what took place at the very moment of your new birth. And here's the reason he lays this down. First of all, he tells you who Christ is. He gives you the absolute doctrine of he is God Almighty, the creator, the sustainer of the universe. There is none greater. He's God in flesh. Then he tells you what he did for you, how that at the moment of your new birth, the separation took place. And then the third thing that he shows you in Colossians is how that those who are the enemies of the gospel of Christ try to come on the scene. They come on religious they come on nice. They come on good works. They come on speaking sweet words and, and wooing you and, and mixing a little gospel in with what they say to try to draw you out from the truth. And the Apostle Paul goes at them with a sledgehammer. That's what he does. He doesn't, he doesn't mince words. Let me show you how he does it. Here's the crowd that tries to take anything away from the grace of God and the new birth. And what God did for you when he saved you. Look at what he says in Colossians chapter number 2 and verse number 16. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days. Now let's stop for a moment. If the Apostle Paul wanted to set aside the Jewish Sabbath, which by the way is not Sunday, folks. Never has been, never will be. The Old Testament Sabbath is sundown Friday till sundown Saturday. That's the Sabbath. It's never changed. Don't ever let some well-meaning preacher tell you otherwise. It's never changed. He says to these people, don't let anybody judge you according to the Sabbath days. There's more than one Sabbath. There's many Sabbaths that lead up to the Passover. There are Sabbaths throughout the year. Israel had a number of Sabbaths they observed. These are all, that's a different study altogether. But the fact is that all of these Sabbath days were nothing in the world more than a type of the true Sabbath, who is our Lord Jesus Christ, where we find our true rest in a person. The book of Hebrews talks at length about how the Son of God is our Sabbath rest not in a day, because of the rest of a day, you had to get up the next day and go back to work again. When you rest in Christ, your work is over, for he has done all the work, and nothing can be added to it. So the Apostle Paul here says, don't let them judge you according to Sabbath days. If he had wanted to make a distinction, an exception of the Jewish Sabbath, don't you think he would have put it in this text? Because this is a very straightforward, powerful statement about the Sabbath, which is the weekly Sabbath. Some call it the Sabbath of Moses, the weekly Sabbath. This would have been the time for the apostle to say it. He could have said, let no man judge you according to Sabbath days, except we should recognize the weekly Sabbath of the Lord. But he didn't do that. So there are people out there that mean well, and I believe some of these people are saved. 
They mean well and they're saved. But don't ever let some well-meaning person drag you back under something and take the grace of God away from you and the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. The point of his finished work is this. That all the bulls, all the goats, all the sacrifices, all the blood that was shed, all the, all the weekly Sabbaths, all the yearly Sabbaths, all the times of Jubilee and all, of the, all the stuff attached to it and associated with it, the kinsman redeemer, everything that Israel had, it all pointed to one person who was able to fulfill completely God's demands in righteousness and no man is able to do that. And the Apostle Paul is, attack, is attacking them with a sledgehammer. He said, don't let these people judge you. Don't let them sweet talk you in making you think that you have to keep some Sabbath, some day, some thing. Don't drink this. Don't drink that. If you're born again, you can drink anything you want to, including strychnine. <laughs> you can drink kerosene if you want to. Gasoline, that'll do a number on you. And it won't put you in hell. It'll take you from this earth faster. And when you start drinking rot gut, it'll start working on your kidneys, and it'll start working on your liver, and it'll start working on your pancreas. You can drink anything you want to drink. Why? Because God has made you free by the grace of God. Now, if you've got any sense at all, you're going to say, Lord, give me some sense about what to drink and what to eat. Have you ever watched anybody die with cirrhosis of the liver? You don't want to watch it. Have you ever watched anybody die from lung cancer? Have you ever watched them cough up blood from smoking cigarettes for 30 or 40 or 50 years? You ever watched that? You ought to see it. You ought to see how yellow somebody turns when their liver is, uh, is uh, jaundiced. You ought, to see what an, you ought to see what a human body looks like after it's gone through decades of drug abuse. Did you know that you can take drugs and it'll build that it can happen? I've had three or four people I've had to deal with this in the past. That if you take drugs, and I'm talking about uh, narcotics and illicit drugs and meth methamphetamines and the whole nine yards. If you're taking all this stuff, that your heart, the sac around your heart, can build up an infection. And that infection can literally take you from this earth. Why? Because you're taking drugs. You will pay for it if you drink. You will pay for it if you smoke. And you will pay for it if you take drugs. So you got any sense tonight? You say, well, if I do that, I'll go to hell. No, you'll go to heaven sooner. That's what will happen to you. That's what will happen to you. You cannot change it. You see, people think I'm a heretic for preaching like this tonight. Well, bless God, it's up to me. If I don't live right, I'm going to go to hell. I I'll wind up going to hell if I don't live right, okay? What is your salvation based upon? Is it based upon the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ for what he did for you at the cross at Calvary? Or is it, is it based upon what he did for you at the cross of Calvary plus what you're able to do? You cannot do one thing tonight to justify yourself. There's not a thing you can do. If you could do something tonight to justify yourself, then Christ is dead in vain. When the Lord Jesus went to the cross, he did what no one else could do. He bought and paid for your salvation. Well, somebody said, well, then I'll just get saved and I can run out and live any way I want to. Where do you find that in the Bible? Once you got saved by the grace of God, you belong to the Lord. And the very moment that you belong to him, then he owns you lock, stock, and barrel. And if he owns you lock, stock, and barrel, that means that he is a father that loves you, is going to chasten you. And he tells you that if you can go out and live any way you please, live like you used to live, you don't know him if he doesn't chasten you. You don't know him. And see, this people, there's an awful lot of people out there, we call them Arminian, from Jacob Arminius who taught you could lose your salvation. There's an awful lot of them out there that they get up and they preach about this stuff. Oh, well, I could lose my salvation. Oh, I, could, I know I could lose my salvation. I've got I've I've to work out my salvation with fear and trembling. I mean, I've got to walk the straight and narrow path. If I don't, I'm going to hell. But their life is as godless and dead as it can be. One of the biggest evangelists in this country was caught uh, dealing with a prostitute down there in Louisiana or somewhere. And the reason he got caught is because he exposed another preacher down there who's doing the same thing. And that preacher said, you're going to do me like this? I'll do you like that. Because he knew how he was living. It's what happens to you. You get up here and you get pumped up in your head. 
So what happened? He was there with the video cameras, and they videoed this man coming out of a prostitute, coming away from a prostitute. They videoed him, got him on tape, and when that happened, he got it before the whole nation and repented, ostensibly repented for what he was doing and said, I have sinned and all that. I pray to God that it was real. But do you know what happened, folks, after that? He got caught again in California doing the same thing, doing the same thing. You say, well, that can happen to anybody. Amen. You better believe it can. Now I'm going to ask you a question. I'll ask him. Where did he lose his salvation? When did he get it back? Between the time he was messing with this prostitute here and then messing with another one out there in California. When did he get it back? When did he get it back? You see what I mean? If God is truly his God, somewhere between here and California or after California, God Almighty is going to meet with him. And he's going to take him to the woodshed. And somewhere between him, here and there and God, God's going to get his message home to him. If you truly belong to me, you better stop going to the prostitutes. I'm taking you from this earth. And he's still around. And since he's still around, it's an indication of one of two things. He's either stopped going to prostitutes or he doesn't belong to God. Right? And if he's still going to prostitutes, he's going to hell. Because after all these years of preaching of, of, that you can lose your salvation, he went out there and he did that, and now he's still up in front of people preaching, and there is no conviction. There's no, there's no, there's no, uh, 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 when God chastens, there's no chastening. None of that has happened, and he's still doing this, and he's still seeing prostitutes and all of that. He's going to hell. Isn't that sad? You see what I'm saying to you tonight? You're not your own. You belong to the Lord. And when God saved you and, my, and wrote your name in the Lamb's book of life, He became your Lord and your Master, whether you like it or not. And He owns you. And that means that He'll let you slip up. He'll let you fall. He'll let you sin. And that all is part of the great plan that God has where he will form character in you and teach you what it is to be forgiven and draw you closer to him. Because the only way that real character can be forgiven is to get victory over your sins and to learn where victory over sin comes from. It doesn't come from your human effort. It comes from the grace of God where God feeds grace to you and you receive that. That's how you get victory over sin. Everybody in this house sins. There's none of us perfect. First John's simply talking, saying very clearly, if you say you have no sin, you're a liar, and the truth's not in you. That's strong talk. So this chastening is very important. Once again, if this man is still going to see prostitutes, and this is 25 to 30 years later, and he has not been chastened of God, and he's still going to see prostitutes. He can get his Bible and look into the camera all he wants to and talk about how God's moved him to do this and God's moved him. He's going to hell because he's not saved. If he has been chastened and he's not going to prostitutes anymore, then that's a good indication he's saved. And he's got a message. And if you've ever met anybody that's been through something like this, they've got a message. Thank God for the message. Thank God for forgiveness, folks. Amen. We can get right with God. Anybody can slip up and mess up. But God forgives. Amen. Hallelujah. Restores. He wants to forgive. He wants to restore. That's why he died. That's why he went to the cross. He went to the cross to make it possible for you to live for him. And then eventually live with him in eternity forever. And there's forgiveness. And once you're truly born again, God won't turn you loose. No, 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 no. All right. And so finally, in Colossians 2 and verse number uh, 18, the Bible says that these are all shadows of things to come, and let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. Worshiping of angels. It's an amazing thing today at how all these supernatural beings are showing up in their films and all of this supernatural stuff is going on. We say, preacher, they don't worship angels. Folks, angels don't have to necessarily come with wings flapping and looking like angels are supposed to look. Angels can appear in all kinds of forms. 
And if you're not worshiping God, you're worshiping the devil. You know, don't you? <laughs> if you're worshiping a false god, you're worshiping the devil. Because he shows up as everything under the sun. If it's not the Lord God Jehovah, folks, you're in trouble. There's only one God. Just one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. The only safeguard you have tonight to keep you from being in, a, in, the, in idolatry and the occult is the Lord Jesus Christ. When you truthfully and honestly receive Christ as your blessed Lord God, Savior, love Him, receive Him to your heart, He will direct you toward true worship of God. But without Him, you have no idea what you're worshiping. This is why he said to the woman at the well, you worship, you know not what. You don't have a clue. And so the Bible says, not holding the head from which all the body by joints and bands having nourishment ministered and knit together increased with the increase of God. Wherefore, if you be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why as though living in the world are you subject to ordinances? Touch not, taste not, handle not, which all to perish with the using, after the commandments and doctrines of men, which things have indeed a show of wisdom and will worship. And humility and neglecting of the body, not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. That's another way of saying, it looks good. It really does. Asceticism looks good. And I'm not up here to condemn asceticism. But asceticism in itself does not make you spiritual. There's nothing you can do that makes you spiritual. You have to be able to receive the grace of God. That makes you spiritual. By receiving the grace of God. And so all of this stuff is man-made stuff. And men like that. They like things to where people can see what kind of, 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 uh, of life they live. Their spiritual life. Their, their Christian life. If they can wear some kind of a badge. <coughs> some kind of a physical, visible representation. They love that. But folks, that does not make you spiritual. The only thing that can make you spiritual is the blood of Christ and a true walk with the Lord. And if you truly walk with the Lord, if you're walking with God the way you ought to be walking with God, you're going to be constantly confessing, Lord God, I'm the chief of sinners. Of all the people on this earth, I need grace more than the rest of them. I am the chief of sinners. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And you do that, and the Holy Spirit will bless you, and he will purge you, and he will fill you. And he will give you power. And he will give you fellowship and communion. But you have to do it and honestly do it. And mean it. And do it daily. Do it momentarily. Do it moment by moment. To live with the Lord. I pray something I've said tonight is helpful. There's so much, so much confusion about this. There's so many people that feel like because they've done something that they're more righteous than somebody else. No, that doesn't make you righteous. Righteousness comes by what Christ did for you, his righteousness, applied to your soul. Amen. Father, in thy name we pray. I pray you'd use what I've said for the glory of God. I pray tonight, Heavenly Father, that the man that did these things that we're talking about tonight, I pray he was chastened. And I pray, if he, I pray he was chastened. And my Heavenly Father, because I pray for his soul. And if he was chastened, then that's proof positive that he really belongs to you. My Heavenly Father, because there's no difference between him and me, anyone else in this house, we're all the same. You will chasten us all. And my Heavenly Father, I pray in Jesus' name for those who heard what I said tonight in this house. I pray you'd help them. I pray you'd speak to them. I pray you'd draw them in the name of Jesus. And for Jesus' sake we ask it. And amen. Hi, this is Daryl Myatt from Keller, Texas. This is a special Bible study about Jesus Christ and how he is, I am, as he said he was. So let's get right into this. How can we really summarize what God means when he tells us that he simply is? In Exodus 3.14, um, when Moses had asked God, you know, who do I tell them sent me? You know, what is his name? Then God says to Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am 
hath sent me unto you. <clears throat> so when Moses asked God what his name was, because there were many alternative names for God, but God's answer was, I am who I am. You know, this was not a typical name such as, you know, God of thunder or Lord of water and earth, but the simplest, most comprehensive, most absolutely fundamental description of who God is. God is. That's the essence of who he is. Before anything else existed, before mountains or horses or angels, before even matter itself, God was. God is. He is the one unalterable reality. So we can worship him anytime, anywhere. He exists not as an impersonal energy in the universe, but as the living God. You know, the Father has life in himself, Jesus said in John 5, 26. No one brought God to life. God doesn't have a mother. He is the one living being who had no birth, and so he is the father of all who have been born. Moses, Joshua, David, Isaiah, and other voices in the Old Testament drew people's attention again and again to the living God. This is what made him different from all those other false gods whose statues sat on shelves and got buried in the sand. Um, <clears throat> you know, the Old Testament prophets spared no sarcasm in talking about false gods because they were not alive, could not be life-giving. You know, Isaiah depicts a man cutting a tree using some of the wood to warm himself, and from the rest he makes a god, his idol. He bows down to it and worships. He prays to it and says, Save me, you are my god. Isaiah 44, verse 17. That's some pretty serious sarcasm. How can the created be greater than the creator? If you make an idol out of a piece of wood or a hunk of metal, how can it be greater than you? Makes no sense, does it? Elsewhere, in verses uh, chapter 40, verse 20, he talks about a man who looks for wood that he hopes will not rot before his god is carved. That's pretty scandalous. He looks for a skilled craftsman to set up an idol that will not topple. After all, it's hard to respect a god that keeps tipping over, right? Uh, do you bend your head if he's leaning one way or another? And if he topples over, wouldn't that suggest that you may fall no matter how strong your allegiance to this deity might be? Hosea said the people consult a wooden idol and are answered by a stick of wood in Hosea 4 verse 12. So just how many intelligent comments have you heard from a hunk of wood lately, or a piece of metal? And so in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul commended one group of believers as those who turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. That's 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 9. Because if one thing is true about idols, it is that they are the most lifeless, most ridiculous objects on the face of the earth. Those of us who have no wooden statues on the hearth however, are no less capable of idolatry. Whenever we make up an idea of God to suit our purposes, we become idolaters. If it doesn't line up with the word of God, we've twisted the truth somehow. The same is true when we put something or someone above God as the determinative influence in our lives. The only kind of God worth worshiping must be a living God. If he's living and all-powerful, he's completely outside of our control. What other kind of God could exercise authority and control over our enemies? So I want to talk to you now about the I amness of God. And let me give you some examples of some of the things Jesus said that he is. Um, first of all, keep in mind this Exodus 3.14 um, when God said, I am has sent me to you. Tell them that I am sent me to you. Okay, let's now go to John. I'm going to be in John a lot today. Let's go to John 8, verse 58. Um, <clears throat> and Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. Okay, keep in mind, Abraham was alive some, well, I don't know exactly how many years, but it's at least 500, probably closer to a thousand years before Jesus Christ was born. So when he says that before 
Abraham was, I am. He's telling these Jewish people listening to him that he was there before Abraham. Yet he was only 33 years old or so at the time. How could that be? He was God in flesh. That's how it could be. He was God in flesh. Let's look at some of the things Jesus said he is. <laughs> some of my favorite things. Let's go to John 14, 6. <clears throat> Probably my most favorite verse in the whole Bible. Jesus said unto them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Yes, in case you haven't noticed, I'm reading strictly out of the King James today. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Let's go to John 8, verse 12. Boy, my Bible is marked up today. Lots of markers. John 8, verse 12. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Okay, so he's the way, he's the truth, he's the life. He's the light uh, let's see, where are we? Let's go to John 15, verse, 15, verse 5. John 15, 5. Oh, goodness. Got stuff everywhere. <laughs> John 15, 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Okay, so he's the vine. Let's go to John 1. Let's have a look at something here. When people argue with you that Jesus Christ was not God in flesh, here's a few passages that prove otherwise. John 1 verse 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And in John 1 verse 14, it says, And the Word was made flesh, and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So if the Word was God, and the Word was made flesh, God was made flesh through the man Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was God in flesh. That's why He was perfect. That's why He was without sin. That's why He could walk on water. That's why he could raise the dead. That's why he could transfigure into spirit in front of witnesses who saw this happen. A mere man could never do that. And there are those who say Jesus is a mere man, just a prophet. They're wrong. He's the Son of God and God in flesh. So if they think he's only a man, they miss the mark. They miss the truth. They're on the broad road to destruction. Okay, um, let's go to 1 John 5, verse 7. 1 John 5, verse 7. Again, King James today. Um, that says, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. They're all God. There's three, but there's one. They're all one. They're one and the same. This says the Word is the same as God. We just read that the Word became flesh. That the Word was God. These three are one. Let's go to John 11, verse 25. And forgive me, I'm jumping all over the place today. John 11, verse 25. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Let's go to John 10. Let's start with verse 9. Verse 9 says, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved, and shall go in and out and find pasture. pasture. Uh, verse 11 in John 10 says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. Verse 14 I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. And verse 30, also of John 10, I and my Father are one. 
some clear teachings from Jesus Christ. Let's go to Matthew 28, verse 19 and 20. You know this one, the Great Commission. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Jesus told us I am many times. He explains exactly who he is and why he's here many times. How people can miss this truth, I, I don't understand. I simply can't fathom how people can miss this. Let's go to John 17, <clears throat> verse 16. 17, 16. Of course, this is Jesus talking. He says, They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. How about Psalm 46, verse 10? Psalm 46, verse 10 says, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. Matthew 16, verse 15. He said unto them, But who say ye that I am? So it's Jesus. He, he's talking to Peter. And, um, you know, earlier he had said, Who do men say that the Son of Man is? And, and, and they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But Jesus said, But who do you say that I am? That's probably the most important question that the Bible asks any of us. Who do you say Jesus is? You think he's a mere man? Just a prophet of God? Or do you know the truth and know that he is the Son of God? He is God in flesh. He died on the cross. He rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven. He's seated at the right hand of God. And he is coming back again one day. These are all absolute truths. Absolute truth. The sooner you accept these truths, the better off you're going to be, both in this life and the next. If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, may I suggest you come to know him very quickly. You need to repent of your sins. You need to believe upon him. As Romans 10 verse 9 says, For with the heart man believe unto righteousness. Uh, oh, wrong one. 10.9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thy heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Let me invite you to ask Jesus Christ into your heart and to repent of your sins. Let me finish with Revelation 1 verse 8. He said, I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. The Almighty. That is my Jesus, my Savior, my Christ, my Messiah, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. He is coming back again very soon, and you need to know him before that happens, because when he appears, if you haven't already accepted him as your Lord and Savior and repented of your sins and asked him into your heart, you'll perish forever separated from God. I'd hate to see that happen. I wouldn't wish that upon my worst enemy. I hope and pray you know him, because he's the only way to eternal life and true salvation. God bless you. Good Lord willing, I'll see you again soon.